This past Sunday, September 13th, the Daily Beast published an article by Ben Collins entitled, What Do You Say to a Roanoke Truther? Ben Collins is clearly an agent of persuasion, and the article is an obvious example of the efforts to which the New World Order will go to further their aims of establishing a totalitarian state and a total weapons ban in a vast conspiracy by terrorizing the people with staged events acted out by crisis actors. There you go, Ben. I threw you a bone. <laughs> Here, I'll give you another one. I just can't process that things happen in this world that can't be explained rationally. In order for me to not lose my mind, events that take place should look carefully planned and coordinated, like the efforts of a committee or a bureaucracy. To even consider the possibility that even one individual with compromised mental faculties might be acting of their own accord irrationally and unchecked by government authorities would devastate me. No, Ben, I don't think any of those things. But I thought you might find it humorous to see how it sounds when someone pretends to confirm the assertions promoted in your article. In a moment, I intend to dissect and critique your article in excruciating detail. Anyone familiar with my work should stay tuned because it's going to be both a laugh riot and a very informative expose on modern techniques of propaganda. Ben, I'm afraid you'll have to choose whether or not to take all of this personally. Not all of my criticisms will be directed at you, but rather at your superiors and the collective that guides your work. In this critique, I'll be treating Ben like the unessential functionary that I think he is. Although parts of the article include Ben in the narrative, it's only to help frame the important messages that the article was intended to include. Far more indicative of who called for the article to be written and why can be learned by examining the publisher, The Daily Beast. So, let's take a brief look at them and their history to better connect the dots. The Daily Beast is presently owned by a large media company called IAC and headed up by Barry Diller, the former head of Paramount Studios and of Fox Broadcasting. In 2012, Barry thought it would be a cool idea to stream all of the broadcast networks over the internet. Despite all of those networks being as crooked as the day is long, it was still basically theft and that's what the Supreme Court decided in 2014. IAC is well positioned to present the truth at their discretion through the various internet properties in their search and applications group, including about.com, ask.com, city search, dictionary.com, investopedia, and thesaurus.com. In both their media and match groups, they own match.com, okcupid, and Tinder, as well as Vimeo. I'll note here that Vimeo removed our documentary, We Need to Talk About Sandy Hook, within 24 hours, citing a breach of their content guidelines. Not a copyright issue, but a content issue. The Daily Beast was originally cooked up by one Tina Brown, which I won't go into here. But in 2010, a merger between The Daily Beast and Newsweek put Tina in the editor role at both companies. Newsweek magazine had been tanking financially for years, and the merger made little sense to analysts at the time. This is as good a time as any to explain that this joint venture was half owned by IAC and half owned by Sidney Harmon. Harmon was a billionaire businessman who died just a year later at the advanced age of 92. Despite his age, he had been married to a woman that could easily have been his daughter, Jane Harmon the Democrat congresswoman from California at the time. Jane Harmon is no doubt a rabid Zionist and the model of a political criminal. In 2009, the NSA revealed that they had wiretaps of conversations where Harmon promised an official of the Israeli government to pull strings and get espionage charges dropped against two employees of AIPAC, America's most influential lobbying group. Because Bush needed Harmon to help pass the warrantless wiretapping program, the investigation into Harmon was blocked. The charges against the two APAC employees were dropped too, by the way. In 2012, Newsweek announced it would stop printing the magazine and become an exclusively online publication. In 2013, Newsweek was acquired by IBT Media, leaving the Daily Beast to IAC. In 2014, Newsweek released its long-anticipated online edition. My first experience with it was when I discovered an article they had published that smelled as rotten as anything I'd ever read. The article was probably a week old when I discovered it, and I noticed there was a button obviously intended to take the reader to the comments for the article. 
but when I clicked it, nothing happened. Being the intrepid investigator that I am, I did a search for a cache of the article and found a version from a few days earlier. That version not only included the comment button, but a comment count of 214. But still, the button did nothing and a search of the code didn't reveal any comments. It seems that Newsweek was playing a shell game with comments, which is really just a form of betraying their customers. I was able to find another Newsweek article published more recently that did include the comments, and let me tell you, it was hilarious. One comment after the next, refuting the material and offering scathing opinions of its authors. As a last point on the Daily Beast and Newsweek, Newsweek has ties that date way back to the Washington Post, known for its deep connections to the CIA. When I began to learn about the possibility that whole media institutions may have been founded as mouthpieces for government propaganda, I immediately suspected Newsweek and the Washington Post, and viewed the Daily Beast as merely being a more modern equivalent. Now let's roll up our sleeves and see what Ben cooked up for us in this article. Trolls told Chris Hurst that his grief over losing his girlfriend in the Roanoke murders was a lie. But I've known him for years. Maybe, I thought, I could get them to listen. Chris Hurst spent the last two weeks trying not to cry on television while telling the world how beautiful his life with his girlfriend was, before she was murdered for no reason. Chris was the boyfriend of Ellison Parker who was shot and killed on live television in August by a mentally ill man who had an invented grudge and easy access to firearms. Chris is a friend from college. Chris and I hosted a radio show together. Or, according to millions of conspiracy theorists online, Chris Hurst is a part of my imagination. We're off to a horrible start here, Ben. I understand and I'm sympathetic to the issue of the need to editorialize, given the format at The Daily Beast, but you're already well outside the bounds of reasonable bias. And for those seeking to identify propaganda, Ben is also beginning to use deception by both misconstruing the assertions of others and pretending his intent from the start was to change their views. I'm not going to challenge Ben on his claim of having known Chris Hurst for years, but I will at least state that I seriously doubt it. Ben wants us to believe that he set out from the start to get them to listen. This implies that had he convinced the conspiracy theorists that the conventional account of the event was probably correct, it would have changed his report significantly. However, if we assume that this article is propaganda with inherent objectives, that wouldn't have been possible. Not to mention that it creates the impression that Ben is tolerant and intent on being objective. Creating an impression like that is often a way in which an author can soften the edge or take the edge off of other obvious agenda-driven content. Ben, how are you aware that Chris had spent those past two weeks trying not to cry on television? I guess it can be assumed that crying isn't conducive to communicating, and it's possible that Chris might have told you that personally. Could Chris have been lying? People do lie, quite easily in fact, especially when it concerns personal issues like whether one was feeling emotional and was fighting back tears. But Chris might consider that, by his appearing in numerous TV interviews right after the purported event, he was in essence inviting the viewers to form opinions. Where I think Ben's actions are despicable is when he invents the theory that millions of people on the internet believe Chris is a part of his imagination. Is he saying that they firmly believe Chris Hurst is a character known to Ben only through his imagination, and that a history exists between the two, but only in the form of a real person's imagination? Or is he saying that these theorists firmly believe Chris Hurst is a real person, but has only been playing a role in Ben's life that extends into the narrative of the event? In either case, Ben states that it's millions that hold this view, which is ludicrous when reconciled with statistics of the views held by Americans and how few Americans are even familiar with the story. Notice that Ben doesn't state that these theorists suspect Chris is a part of his imagination, but rather leaves us to assume that they believe it is true. This is another way in which a propagandist frames the debate to make those who hold views counter to the narrative appear fixed in their thinking and less likely to have considered any alternative views. In the minds and YouTube videos of some conspiracy theorists, 
Chris is not a news anchor at WDBJ in Virginia. Chris, the videos say, is a crisis actor invented less than a month ago by the United States government as part of a false flag operation that will eventually allow the New World Order to take away every American citizen's guns and force them into a life of subjugation and tyranny. Here's the first of many examples in the article where the focus is put on theories of crisis actors being used in deceptive events presented by the media as authentic. No attempt is made by Ben or anyone he quotes in the article to clarify what exactly a crisis actor is. Using the term as loosely as Ben does in this article, I could make the claim that Ben himself is a crisis actor, as he appears to be acting in collaboration with the perpetrators of the staged event. Here Chris is careful to introduce the topic of guns without demonizing them or those that support gun rights. He chose to mention them as part of a detailed theory he's falsely attributing to some conspiracy theorists. By blending both aspects of authentic theories with those that he knows are nonsense or unrelated, he helps the reader to dismiss all the theories in the package he's created. Every day now, Chris wakes up to find strangers hate on his Facebook wall that he has to personally delete. Or he'll Google Allison to find the people he has to thank for donating to her scholarships and he'll see, instead, another conspiracy theory YouTube video, viewed 800,000 times over, that says Allison was in on it all along, and that she's been given a new life and maybe plastic surgery by the government. And the deceptions and distortions just keep coming. It begins with a little truth, explaining how Chris is receiving some hate via his Facebook page. Hey Ben, you should tell Chris that he can tweak his Facebook account to prevent that, unless the hate is coming from family members or coworkers. And I think it's worth noting that Facebook accounts aren't mandatory. It was a nice touch to add that Chris has to personally delete the hate messages on his Facebook page. Again, Ben presents Chris thanking people for donating to some scholarship fund as somehow being mandatory. Here's a question I have. Why is Chris responsible for a scholarship fund in the first place? This sounds like a tenuous and totally unnecessary exercise. As if people will feel slighted for having donated to a fund set up by this woman's family if they don't receive a personal note of thanks from Chris. But most interesting to me is Ben's assertion that Chris has to Google Allison just to find people who have donated to this scholarship. Is Chris unable to bookmark a page or remember the website where this fund information appears? And how exactly does Googling Allison force a YouTube video to appear? Ben, I have to call you out on all of this. It sounds more to me like you had to personally hunt down a few of these videos, and had you not, you would have been oblivious to them. It's as if what you'd like to claim is that it's either illegal, or it is at least immoral for these videos to exist at all, regardless of whether you have access to them or not. It happened again about an hour ago, Chris says. It's hard for me to manage that because I hit landmines when I do. They have all these details I don't want to know. The most recent one says Allison was dating someone else and that she and Chris were never together at all. That person is really Allison's ex-boyfriend, who conspiracists found by looking through her old Facebook photos. Two weeks after he lost the love of his life in the most gruesome and devastating way imaginable, this is what he has to sit through when he turns on his computer each morning. The hoax theories have taken a toll for sure, he says. I've definitely felt it more than anyone. I'm the one with the Facebook and Twitter page. Ben goes out of his way to describe the purported shooting death of Allison as the most gruesome and devastating way imaginable, more than once in the article. No doubt, a shooting death can be horrible, but can no worse form of death be imagined? According to Ben, no. Regardless of what Chris will claim his motivations were for giving numerous televised interviews, they ultimately left the viewer seeing him as a victim. So, it's not surprising that he said, quote, I'm the one with the Facebook and Twitter page, unquote, as if he's the only person in the world being attacked by Facebook and Twitter. The fact that Ben includes the quote without framing it in the context of the real world shows that Chris's victimization role suits his agenda well. 
It is simply easier for some people to believe that the United States government has concocted a vast conspiracy to take away all of our guns than it is to believe that it is too easy for a mentally ill person to acquire one and shoot anyone they want. And now those same people are taking it out on the families of the victims of gun violence after a tragedy. The last decade has seen a boon for crisis actor conspiracies on the web, and along with them, a new set of psychologists and philosophers are trying to understand how people get dragged so far away from reality. Many of these thinkers have settled on a basic premise and it's one that could help explain the mass shooting per day epidemic in America too. That brief section, I suspect, contained the meat of the propaganda and also the most inflammatory statements. First, it contains the long-ago established talking point disseminated amongst the agencies involved in the greater anti-gun rights propaganda campaign. It goes like this. People like myself and others who suspect that these shooting events are largely being staged only think so because our delicate psyches can't fathom that unstable individuals could act unpredictably and kill people, which would shatter our unbreakable faith in social order. If one were to consider all of the possible explanations for why so many question the authenticity of these events that don't acknowledge that we might be right, you can see why this explanation has become the standard. It is, however, totally ridiculous, and almost certainly thought to be so by proponents of it. One can almost excuse Ben for spreading it, but when considering the experts he later quotes are promoting the explanation, it may become harder to be forgiving. At minimum, it's patronizing to those few people who dare question the official narratives. At worst, it paints all of us with a very broad brush. Where there can be no excuse and no forgiving is when Ben thinks our far-away-from-reality thinking may help explain what he purports is an epidemic of mass shootings every day now in America. In other words, crazy people who question these events are probably thinking just like the crazy shooters in these events. Ben, this is where you've acted at your worst and what will eliminate any possible consideration of leniency when the time comes to answer for your involvement in all of this. Conspiracy theorists are, I submit, some of the last believers in an ordered universe. Pitzer College philosophy professor Brian Keeley wrote in, of conspiracy theories. By supposing that current events are under the control of nefarious agents, conspiracy theories entail that such events are capable of being controlled. In other words, if nothing's an accident and there are no lone wolf attacks or gunfights over petty grievances, then there is no gun problem. There is no mental health problem either. For those who believe in crisis class theory, there are just big theatrical attacks put on by the real problem, whoever is in charge. All you have to do is forget about the 2,567 people left dead by gun accidents, lone wolf attacks, and gunfights over petty grievances that weren't caught on camera between June's mass shooting at a church in Charleston, South Carolina, and the live on TV execution two weeks ago. All you have to do is refuse to admit, as Keeley's same academic paper notes in its introduction, that shit happens. Instead, every death, workplace death by gun, school death by gun, hunting accident death by gun is part of a diabolical plan to control the United States, no matter what. For what purpose? The answer is unclear. Let's all take a moment to congratulate Professor Brian Keeley for either bravely publishing a book with a title that proves him to be an inept and uneducated man, or for doing so knowing it would leave him open to criticism for use of a term popularized by the Mockingbird media. Of course, conspiracy theory was a term the CIA strongly advised their agents within American media use to shut down any debate of the Warren Commission's legitimacy. And here we have a modern-day professor of philosophy using the term within the very title of his book and presumably hoping to be taken seriously. My guess is Professor Keeley knows full well the history of the phrase, so huzzah to him for being so brave as to be associated with it. Seriously though, if the viewer thinks there's anything of value in this book, or in this article for that matter, consider this. A search of the phrase crisis class theory led only to quotes from this article. It appears to be a phrase Ben has invented. Once again, Ben has chosen very deliberately to misconstrue the opinions of those who have suspicions about these shooting events. He states that these people, including myself, think 
Every death is part of a diabolical plan. Not that some are. He doesn't even entertain the possibility that some might be questioning just this single event while accepting all others as being legitimate. To add to what I explained earlier about propagandists, this is a tactic used by them to misrepresent the arguments of others so as to avoid addressing the real arguments they present. It's a dishonest but very effective technique. But when I talk to Tom, a conspiracy theorist who has racked up millions of views on YouTube by telling people that Chris and Allison are crisis actors for the US government, he has a much different explanation for all of it. You're being duped. I saw the worst video by mistake. A newsroom co-worker muttered, Oh my God, is he tweeting? Then there was Vester Lee Flanagan's shoddy GoPro footage auto-playing on a computer behind me. A monster walking towards Adam Ward and Allison Parker with a handgun. I couldn't turn it off fast enough. I saw the whole thing. I wretched. I went outside to cry, like a child, like an idiot. This is the opposite of how Tom reacted. The underground footage from the shooter's perspective. That's what really sparked my interest into the event, says Tom, who refused to give his last name to the Daily Beast. It seems odd to me that the shooter walked right up. Now we're being introduced to Tom, who we're being told by Ben has received millions of views for YouTube videos that specifically claim Chris and Allison are crisis actors. Millions, Ben? Are you sure you're not just citing Tom's total historical view count? Or are you saying that he's received millions of views in just the two weeks that transpired between the event and your article? Ben wants us to believe, because he states it explicitly in unmistakable terms, that he went outside to cry after viewing the Flanagan shooting footage. Ben is male, apparently a sensitive male. I ask just the male viewers out there to ask themselves, would you have cried after seeing that video? Would you have cried even if you had been a former college classmate of Chris, who doesn't appear in the video by the way? Would you imagine that even the most sensitive man you know would have cried at the sight? Ben, I'm going to have to ask that you strike that personal account from your overall arguments. That is a detail impossible to verify and relies exclusively on your word, which at this point I argue isn't worth much. Which only makes it more insidious when you add that going outside to cry was the opposite of how Tom reacted. But wouldn't the opposite of crying be laughing? But you're not implying that Tom laughed in response to the video, are you? You then point out that Tom refused to give his last name. So, despite the fact that you made contact with him and that he agreed to be interviewed but requested that his last name not be used, you chose to frame that request as a refusal. Doesn't the word refused tend to mean non-compliance? Again, I view this as another technique of the propagandist, in this case to portray someone with an opposing view as someone unwilling to comply with some requirement or demand. Of course, we know Tom's willingness to be interviewed for the article was likely in good faith and not in any way a requirement of some kind. Tom says he was one of the first people on YouTube to bring up what he considers to be inconsistencies between Flanagan's video of the shooting and the one that aired on WDBJ. He says that the shooter points his gun at Parker's face for over 20 seconds. This, by the way, is not true. You can count the 23 seconds he stands there with a the gun in Allison Parker's face. That sparked my interest from the get-go. You had that going on, he says. Then Tom saw Chris Morn on television and he was convinced. These people are put up to it by the same actors who did the Sandy Hook shooting. The reactions didn't seem genuine to me. The lines seemed scripted. For instance, Chris Hurst would come out and say we're the cutest, newsiest, prettiest couple ever. Of course, he was reading from a photo diary or whatever. He says, you look at Chris Hurst, specifically, he would give the same answers to different reporters, word for word. Tom believes it would be impossible to keep it together after the death of a loved one. When Tom states the shooter points his gun at Allison's face for over 20 seconds, Ben adds that it's not true. However, he doesn't have the courtesy to tell his readers what is true. My guess is that it's because had he given the real time, it may have been something like 18 seconds, which wouldn't really have made much of a difference. 
Or would it have encouraged readers to maybe view the video themselves, which may have introduced the issue of where exactly the gun was pointed during that time? Tom says if we can trust the accuracy of the quote that, quote, he stands there with a gun in Allison Parker's face, unquote. But Ben paraphrases Tom with, quote, shooter points his gun at Parker's face, unquote. Is it any surprise that Ben chose to alter Tom's quote just slightly? Ben wraps up this segment by stating that Tom believes it would be impossible to keep it together after the death of a loved one. Since there aren't any quotes of Tom saying any such thing, we'll have to take Ben's word for it. But my guess is Ben used the word impossible, whereas Tom likely said nothing of the sort. Boy, it's looking more and more like I should get in touch with Tom and ask him myself. It's a reaction that Chris finds monstrous. He feels as if he's being punished for his strength. I cried for days, but tried to be strong on TV for her, he says. But because I went on TV and didn't break down, now I'm all of a sudden an actor. Still, that sentiment was enough to get 792,000 people to watch Tom's video on YouTube under one of his channels, Press Reset Ultimate. When you Google Chris's name, the video crisis actor revealed. Victim's boyfriend Chris Hurst appears on the first page of results. I think, in the end, a lot of these groups are behind the scenes perpetrating these false flag hoaxes in an effort to install a totalitarian government, not only in America but all over the globe, he says. Brian Keeley has heard Tom's entire spiel before. In fact, he's heard it for decades. In 1999, he wrote the book on it. Well, the academic journal entry on it that has grown prescient in the age of the crisis actor. At their core, he says, people like Tom fail to grasp a simple idea. Sometimes things just happen, often for no discernible reason whatsoever. Just as with the physical world, where hurricanes, tornadoes, and other acts of God just happen, the same is true of the social world, he wrote. Some people just do things. They assassinate world leaders, act on poorly thought out ideologies, and leave clues at the scene of the crime. Too strong a belief in the rationality of people in general, or of the world, will lead us to seek purposive explanations where none exists. He says conspiracy theorists rely on what he calls errant data or random minutia within a terror attack or major event that can and maybe should go unexplained in reality. Those pushing conspiracies, however, seize on that unexplained info and attempt to explain it in full. It is an effort to connect every dot on the map, every blade of grass on the grassy knoll even if some dots have nothing to with the larger event at all. Okay, that was a lengthy segment, and I realize it may be tiresome listening to the robotic narrator but I'm trying to avoid tearing into every sentence. But let's just look at the crisis actor concept which Ben even mentions when he describes us living in the age of the crisis actor. Yes, there are companies across America that either exclusively specialize in providing crisis actors or provide them as a component of a larger service offering. So what's a crisis actor? These are people who are hired to act out various roles as part of multi-agency drills involving a number of crisis scenarios, hence the term crisis actor. It's really quite simple, which causes me to wonder why Ben keeps bringing it up in ways that seem to challenge whether such a thing even exists. Of course they exist. Not only do ads appear from time to time in Craigslist and other places advertising a need for crisis actors for an upcoming drill or exercise, the companies that regularly provide crisis actors as their business have websites that advertise the service. People like Tom and others are simply theorizing that these crisis actors are sometimes used in simulated events that are later sold by the media to the public as real. Note also that Ben first says that Brian Keeley wrote the book on it before clarifying that he wrote the academic journal entry on it. This, to people familiar with argument techniques, is what's called an appeal to authority. We're to assume that merely because something appears in an academic journal, it must therefore be the truth. What Mr. Keeley and many others are describing is a psychological characteristic that every human being possesses to some degree and that a small percentage of people will exhibit more so. When these people appeal to authority and encapsulate the entire body of people questioning government propaganda as all falsely interpreting errant data, 
It's a way to dismiss every question and encourage readers to do the same. Logically, not all people asking questions about official accounts are meritless or a case of merely misinterpreting errant data. Ben, it's looking more and more like I should spend a moment covering past events now widely accepted in academia as examples of government conspiracies. But then I'd leave it open for you to respond by pointing out that present society is somehow less apt to be subject to such deceptions. Let's let the rest of the article decide. The crisis actor thing is interesting. These are people who are trying to be rational and they're presented with these grieving people. They need to make sense of that data. So their only rational explanation is, those people are lying. Those people are paid actors, Keeley tells the Daily Beast. That's the only way you can make sense of it with your own two eyes. In other words, there's no real logic that can prove crisis actor conspiracies wrong to people who really want them to be right. Crisis class theory is first and foremost a phenomenon of the Internet age, and is perfectly suited to the enormous amount of documentary evidence surrounding recent events, writes Michael Wood. While a false flag scenario might have trouble explaining a particular apparent anomaly, a staged hoax theory would have no trouble doing so. Wood is a psychologist and lecturer at the University of Winchester and wrote extensively about crisis actors in 2013. He calls it the future of Internet conspiracism. And Wood's thesis gets to the heart of why people like Tom likely believe what he does. Crisis class theory is a weirdly hopeful, terribly reductionist coping mechanism, a way to explain a world that can be unjust and needlessly cruel but wouldn't be if the bad guys controlling it all were vanquished. There is surely some psychological comfort in believing that a horrific event like a mass murder of school children never really happened at all, that it was all fake, he writes. Once again, I want to point out how patronizing it is when the suspicions of Americans like myself and countless others are deemed irrational or comport with our uncontrollable biases. What Ben, Keeley, and Wood are saying is that each of us have learned nothing from experiencing a horrible car wreck in which there were injuries or deaths, from witnessing an animal in the road being struck by a vehicle, from having our computers crash before saving a critical document, from knowing someone whose baby was born with urgent health issues, or worse yet, stillborn. These men and others are working hard to make us believe that they don't consider these things to have been sufficient to reveal the complex and infinitely unexplainable nature of our world, our reality. No, we must be seeking order in everything that happens. We must provide an explanation to everything, and when presented with unexplainable or mysterious events, we are incapable of reconciling that. I'll tell you what, the bad guys promoting this terribly reductionist theory should be vanquished indeed. Instead, conspiracy theories often work to dispel bad press affecting the theorists' own social groups. Gun owners, for example, work to implicate every other trait about mass shooters except their one common bond, access to a gun for long enough to kill several people. We call it social threat in psychology, and a lot of psychology is how we deal with these sorts of threats. It's a tribal thing, says Wood. We see these sorts of mass shootings. If you're a gun owner, you have a lot invested in this, yourself. You have a motivation to take this out of your wheelhouse. If all you know about somebody is that they own a gun, you're automatically motivated to discount it. Sure enough, Tom believes one of the reasons why the American people have so much freedom and so much power is because of our right to bear arms that acts as a firewall or insurance policy against a tyrannical government. This is where I can almost always exclude myself, as I don't consider myself to be part of any particular social group. Maybe you would say the same of yourself. But that doesn't stop Ben from describing gun owners as a social group, and one that tends to pretend that guns aren't a part of the mass shooter equation. Ben, it might help you to tweak your analysis of gun owners to know that myself and many others aren't diminishing the role that guns play in mass shootings. We're actually challenging the authenticity of the shootings themselves. Do you understand? And does that mean that we all think that every shooting is staged? No, not at all. And why is it that only us gun owners that are subject to bias and apt to play down the role of guns in shootings? Why can't the same logic apply to leftist, Bolshevist, anti-gun rights people? 
Why doesn't their clear bias lead them to ascribe too much importance to gun rights? I mean, they're even willing to employ deception in their attempts to reverse American gun rights. Doesn't that indicate their agenda is no more honorable than that of gun owners? Tom is nowhere near alone in this. He's one of countless thousands who've descended in recent years into the weeds of false flags and crisis actors. It's a kind of explosion of conspiracy theories that began popping up around 2009, according to Professor Joe Asinski. This happens for every president. It's not just birthers, with President Obama. In 2001, a building blows up and some people think George W. Bush did it, says Asinski. In fact, there are the same number of 9-11 truthers as there are birthers. Asinski wrote Conspiracy Theories Are For Losers, which posits that conspiracy theories pervade amongst members of parties who are out of power and feel helpless in a political tide moving in the opposite direction. Barack Obama's election spurred countless new conspiracy theories around the 2008 election, and Tom fell into a lot of them. That year, he says he started reading up on conspiracies about the financial crisis as a freshman in college, while studying for his B.A. in business. You see this scapegoating as a social phenomenon against some gun owners who stake a lot of their social identity on that, says Wood, so they fight back. On the Internet, everything's a false flag if you look hard enough. Now, semi-educated anonymous people believe they're telling the truth in a society of lies, like Tom says. That segment actually includes my very favorite quote. It includes that Joe Usinski said, quote, In 2001, a building blows up, and some people think George W. Bush did it. Ha! I love it. Both he and Ben miss the valuable insight contained within that statement. For both Ben's and Joe's benefit, according to the official account of 9-11, no buildings were blown up, okay? There were a few building collapses, but those had nothing to do with explosives of any kind. Maybe Usinski is revealing what he truly thinks of 9-11. After all, if a psychopath sees it as beneficial to lie or avoid the truth, they're apt to do so, regardless of their high-ranking position or stellar reputation. And with Usinski, we can either uh, congratulate him for his bravery or willingness to use the defunct term conspiracy theory in the very title of his book. Here Ben also goes for the ploy of claiming it's also partisan politics that can be blamed for an explosion of conspiracy theories. Apparently, the party out of favor at the present time will seek to regain some power through inventing conspiracy theories. Ben doesn't expect us to think carefully about this explanation, so he isn't worried that it makes little to no sense. So, is it the Republicans inventing these theories because the present administration is Democratic? Uh, but it not that situation complicated by polls that show Americans strongly dislike the administration? And haven't the past few months been a boon for the Republicans? So is it the Democrats inventing this questioning of the Virginia shooting as a way for them to regain some power? Ben, I'm surprised when you described the surge in conspiracy theories after the election of Obama that you didn't just come right out and describe it as an offshoot of racism. Come on, man. I know you wanted to. But I guess that would have been pretty disingenuous. Personally, I see it as being no less disingenuous when you described us conspiracy theorists as semi-educated anonymous people who believe they're telling the truth in a society of lies. I wonder how you would describe the likes of Peter Dale Scott. I know he's not anonymous, but is he semi-educated enough for his theories to be approved by the likes of you? And if that's all it was, if Tom and his co-conspirators were just spinning a comforting story for themselves it might not be so bad. But Tom has been spending the last two weeks ruining my friend's already broken life. Tom is crushing a victim for a second time, and he doesn't know or care that the victim can see it. Ben helps to portray Chris as the victim here, despite that not being true in the slightest, by describing Tom's actions over two weeks as ruining Chris's already broken life. My only guess as to why Ben would make this claim is to further dismiss what Tom was really doing during those two weeks, that being attempting to point out the very suspicious nature of an event being promoted nationally by the media. When Ben points out that Tom doesn't know or care that the victim can see it, he's partly correct. He's wrong to describe Chris as the victim in this context, 
but he's right to point out that Tom didn't know or care. What's likely a more accurate description of Tom's thoughts on the matter is that Tom is well aware of the implications of his statements, but simply thinks that alerting others to the possibility that trusted institutions are committing immeasurably harmful acts of treason against the very Americans they are charged with protecting from such things is too significant an issue to be concerned with what a single individual might have to endure as a consequence an individual who would necessarily be involved in the criminal treason, to be clear. So then I come out with it. I tell Tom that I know Chris. I decide to make an appeal. I decide to try to stop Tom from doing all of this to my friend. I decide to tell Tom a story. Nervous. It comes out inelegantly, in pieces. It goes like this. One day, Chris and I forgot to bring headphones to our college radio show. I'll repeat that, we didn't bring headphones. The only thing a person truly needs to make sure he or she is on the air to a radio show. By the end, we thought we'd pulled it off. We'd done an hour of radio without the second most important piece of equipment. A genuine miracle. The programming director brought us in a few days later to scream the words literal radio silence to us over and over again. The incompetence was staggering, and we were ashamed before it became a very funny memory. I bring up the radio show to Tom to say this. If Chris Hurst is a fake, he's terrible at it. If Chris Hurst is a crisis actor working for the United States government in a long-term plot to strip U.S. citizens of their guns and freedom, he is the worst one in the world. Ben, your story is simply irrelevant, and I have to assume that you've simply included it to gain sympathy from your readers. It's akin to character development in a movie. The director has to find ways in which to make the audience care at least somewhat for the protagonist. But doesn't Tom deserve a story, to be fair? Isn't Tom deserving a, of an endearing tale to give your readers a reason to care about him? Since you didn't extend to Tom the same courtesy of allowing him to tell his personal story, I'll just insert my own, which could easily apply to Tom in a situation such as this. It goes like this. My independent journalism and activism, if you were to tally all that it has brought to me or in what ways it has impacted my life, would amount to 95% expressions of anger towards it, ridicule of it, shaming me for doing it, and distancing oneself from me because I do it. This has been true to some degree even with family and close friends. It has never led to a promotion or approval from some authoritative group. Society at large has chosen to ignore me, for the most part. It hasn't all been bad. That 5% remaining accounts for those people who have thanked and encouraged me. Some have reached out to me, while others have become friends. Still, despite how much I've appreciated their kind words and support, the far more numerous negative effects have been the familiar experience. It's a lonely, challenging, and in some ways unnatural endeavor. It almost dictates that I view everything from the outside, especially of groups with shared views. Even amongst so-called conspiracy theorists, I must choose the truth over commonality or acceptance. Ultimately, I will look back and be as pleased as anyone could ever be for taking this path. I no longer wonder if it will be worth it. It will be. I ask Tom, how would you respond to that? Then, silence. Seconds of strained, shifty quiet. My response to that is either he's being duped or you're being duped. This woman, Allison, I don't know where she is. It's my suspicion that you're being duped, if that's the case. It looks like the guy is acting. It doesn't seem like he's being genuine, says Tom. But what if you're wrong? Have you considered that? Have you considered what it would be like to be Chris? I have been so respectful. I have been too respectful. I am trying, for some reason, to convince Tom that I'm not in on it, that I'm fallible enough but still professional. I'm trying not to appear to him to be part of a problem he is wholly dreaming up. I am trying not to yell. I'm trying to be the one person who says, you're wrong, but I hear you. This way is supposed to work, the academics tell me. Listen to the lost people, and sometimes they will hear you out in return. I am being nice. Still, I am trying to get him to see the life he is destroying again every morning. I'm trying not to say, how could you? I say, what if you're wrong? Without stating so directly, 
Ben's questioning is intended to be taken as him asking how Tom or anyone could question whether Chris is a real person or not. This, of course, is not at all what people are questioning. They're questioning whether Chris has participated in a psychological operation of some kind that required him to pretend to be the boyfriend of a purported murder victim. Ben asks Tom how he would respond to that. I presume he doesn't ask any specific question here because he doesn't want a reasonable answer to one. Instead, he gives Tom a story about a past experience with Chris, followed by a couple irrelevant statements about how Chris is a terrible actor if he has been playing a role for his entire life, which nobody has claimed. Then he asks for a response. Ben then goes on to describe how he had been trying to remain respectful. Presumably, we're supposed to think that the more reasonable approach would have been for Ben to be disrespectful. This would have been the correct human response to Ben requesting to interview a stranger that had theories about an event that Ben disagreed with. An event that, mind you, Ben has no real connection to, unless Ben is suggesting his tenuous past friendship with Chris Hurst somehow constitutes legal standing in this matter. And treason is a matter for the courts perhaps even an international court, if there's any truth to what many people now suspect of this and other events. This may be why, at least subconsciously, Ben is feigning such improbable outrage and making claims to have cried over the affair. If I am indeed wrong, then I feel bad for the guy. It's a terrible tragedy, but that doesn't mean I'm not gonna have my opinion. That's just what I see, he says. If that happened to me, and it really did happen, and people were calling it a false flag or a hoax, I would disagree with them, but I would have to respect their freedom of speech. But really, Tom, really, this is the worst thing that could happen to anyone. He watched his to-be fiancé die in an unrepeatable way. He almost evaded seeing a picture of her death until the morning after it happened, but he didn't. He couldn't. He saw it on the cover of the New York Daily News. He saw his soulmate shot in three frames, one alive, one bracing for a bullet and one as she was dying, and he writes to me and he says, I broke when I saw the daily news, and then he goes onto his Facebook wall one morning and someone says that she was an actor all along, or that she's alive on an island somewhere, or that he was part of her death, or that he and the love of his life were never in love all along and this was you, Tom, and now this happens every morning, and this was you who started it, Tom, I mean, really, Tom. Really? What if you're wrong? If I'm wrong, my heart goes out to Allison's family and Chris Hurst, but it's my opinion that it's not obviously wrong. Tom, that's not enough. Ben shouldn't have overplayed his hand during this last attempt to shame Tom and others questioning the event. Rather than leave the facts as they were, he couldn't resist making a false and outrageous claim. Before that, he describes the event as, quote, the worst thing that could happen to anyone." Unquote. Anyone, Ben? Are you sure that if a person's child were to be abducted, followed by a roller coaster ride of hopes being dashed that they would be recovered, then leading to their being found, only to discover they had been tortured horribly for an extended period? A person's own child? Would that not be worse, Ben? Even worse than that disgusting disregard for the horrible things some people have endured, he then describes Chris having to see his soulmate being shot in three frames, one alive, one bracing for a bullet, and one as she was laying dying. I've seen both videos purporting to be of the event playing out live in full, and neither video could any reasonable person describe even a single frame as depicting Allison as she was dying. So despite the supposed horror of the event, and tragedy of its outcome, Ben is still willing to invent an element of it to complete the image he's painting. Ben, even the purported Nazis, identified that propaganda need not involve lying. However, in cases where a group has staged an event they have later portrayed as real, there are many lies that must be told. The propaganda efforts will at best emanate from the lies and at worst be itself a lie. Even if the event had been authentic and everything said by Chris and other parties involved been true, it wouldn't have been a sufficient excuse for the horrible distortions and skewed reporting contained within this article. I hope this critique and the insight into propaganda techniques has been enlightening. Lastly, 
Ben and the editors at the Daily Beast should know that I am more than happy to participate in a live debate of the event in question, or of anything stated in this video critique. I'm afraid I will have to decline to be interviewed by the Daily Beast for any forthcoming articles, however.